Good afternoon, everyone. I greeted most of you individually. And now I greet you as a group. I understand that all gathered here today as a group are part of smaller groups and that many of you have your own separate groups or participate in different activities. Yet, here we are in this meeting as if in a single family where the concept of diverse and separate groups disappears. No longer is it that I am of this or that other group, that I am from the Ote table or from the river, referencing groups sitting at different tables at the conference. I don't know. But here today, we can consider this to be the meeting of the family of the divine will, just like in a typical family. Each of the married children has their own home. One might live in a town, another lives in the city. But when Christmas comes around, the family comes together as one big family, overcoming all those barriers that everyday life circumstances or distances can create for us. I like this opportunity because, I repeat, it is a reunion of the family, of the divine will. A reunion that unites us and is motivated by our desire to want to know and to grow deeper in the knowledge of the divine will. About 15 days or so ago, two or three weeks, we were at a reunion in San Jose, Costa Rica, and the same thing, more or less, happened at that meeting. There were people from different towns and cities who lived more or less close to San Jose. They didn't see each other often because each group had different schedule group days and times. And some had different group functions. And occasionally, they all gather together and hold a big reunion. This group was the one who came up with this name, Reunion of the Family of the Divine Will. As I was saying, we all have the same objective, to know and grow deeper in the knowledge of what is the divine will. To do so, we especially take advantage of the writings of Luisa Picaretta, servant of God, whose beatification cause, as you know, is open to grow deeper in the knowledge of the divine will. The focus is not on what the will of God disposes, but rather on how it operates. Until now, about the will of God, we have first learned about the dispositions of the will of God. Remember, before original sin, Adam lived of the will of God. He didn't need the dispositions of the will of God. He did not need the commandments of the will of God. What he needed and had was the will of God as life. In the same way as in God. God does not need commandments. In what way or how is God governed by his will? His will is greater to him than his law. His will is his life. And that life was the life of, that Adam had as his own. Therefore, there was no need for commandments. Original sin comes 
and man breaks his alliance with the will of God, leaving the human will adrift and losing the life of the divine will in him, he needed the dispositions of the will of God to straighten his conduct according to those dispositions. Again, Adam lost the will of God as life, having separated from the divine will he was left adrift. As a consequence, he needed the dispositions of the will of God to be in order with the divine will. Keep in mind, when original sin started, the sins of humanity also started. Homicides, adulteries, these didn't exist before original sin. The human will falls so deep it begins to drift and to do evil. As a consequence, man needed the dispositions of the will of God to be in order with the will of God, hoping that over time the human will would again have the divine will as life because that was the promise that God made to Adam as soon as he fell in original sin remember how the promise of redemption is described in the Bible in Genesis, let us use our imagination to transport ourselves to that moment when Adam lost the fullness of life in the divine will and was stripped naked of the divine will, dressed only with the rags of the human will, and God promises him redemption what would have been Adam's thought? He thought that what he lost would be restored to his offspring. Not that he would only be forgiven. He didn't think it was only that. He would not go to hell. He thought that heaven would be reopened to him that he or his descendants, most likely his descendants, would regain the state that he lost. I don't think Adam understood the work of redemption as being limited. As we, up until this point, have understood it to be. When the promise of the work of redemption was made, Adam must have understood restitution of all that he had lost. Once, once the human will separated from the will of God, their descendants began to fall deeper. Adam committed original sin. Eve, we will say, the same. Their children fall to the depth of evil. They were murderers, a sign that they had fallen deeper. Adam was not a murderer. However, Cain was, and there were idolaters. During that first stage of Adam, man slipped deeper and deeper into evil. You know the story. There is no need for me to narrate the details. This is why the time for Moses comes and God decides to give the law to express to make 
known to the creature the dispositions of his will, the orders of his will, that the creature, that man, might begin to straighten towards God, obeying those laws. The Ten Commandments are given to Moses as expression, as dispositions, as orders of the will of God. We all know the Ten Commandments. God takes the initiative and begins to give us to know about His will again by the way of His dispositions. Redemption comes later on in history. We'll, we'll expand on it later. Up until now, when speaking of the will of God, what has been understood is the dispositions of the will of God. So much so that on many occasions, people have said to me when hearing the will of God, the will of God? What do you want to teach us about God's will? If the will of God is in the commandments, and the will of God is in the gospel, in the dispositions of the will of God, be meek, be humble, poverty, all the evangelical counsels, everything that forms the gospel is the manifestation of the will of God. What else would you be able to teach us about the will of God? As if saying, what other dispositions of the will of God would you be able to teach us? If or if of the will of God all is known. For this same reason, it is why when talking about the will of God according to Luisa's writings, people wrongly say it's a new thing because they believe without deeply understanding that they are new dispositions of the will of God. But it is not so. These are not new dispositions of the will of God. It is that the creature, after being reordered, after being reordered with God, fulfilling His dispositions, God decides, as He tells Luisa, to give his will as life again. To make this happen, he needed to let us know how his will works in his interior. He did not want, he no longer needed to show us more dispositions or more orders. He didn't say, well, I already gave you Ten Commandments, but a new commandment I give you. This would be the 11th or the second elevated to a supernatural level. He did not come to give us the 12th, the 13th, the 14th and 15 commandments. No, rather what happens is that he who keeps the 10 commandments and all the gospels as disposition of the will of God may know how the divine will works and how the divine will wants to work in us. And if anything has been made known about the will of God, it is because God manifested it. If there had been no revelations from the time of Adam in sin, Adam's sinner to the present, of God, of His will, of what He wants from the creature and for what purpose He created us, imagine where we would find ourselves now and what would be our state after all these centuries. I am not referring to the entrenchment more or less of evil, but of how ignorant we are of who is God and who we are. Everything that has been known about the will of God has been 
because God has revealed it. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. And he has revealed it using the different ways he has available. Either by means of what is now referred to as public or official revelation or through the action of the Holy Spirit throughout the church and in some of its members in a particular way that serves the good of the whole church because it leads us to deeper knowledge of the will of God of that will that Adam lost. For the purpose of learning more and going deeper into the will of God, as I previously explained, we have Luisa's writings. For those of us that in some way have understood all this, all of our attention should be on these writings. And now having these writings before us, comprehending how the divine will operates in itself, and that in this same way wants to operate in us, and wants us to operate in it. And how far its operating reaches, when we fully comprehend this, all other things become insipid, as if losing their flavor and importance, or they recover its importance because these things serve for a purpose. I repeat, there are things that lose a little of their importance, but there are things that reacquire their importance, such as the sacraments, such as prayer, such as the passion of our Lord, such as with the knowledge of the divine will, they reacquire a value that before they did not seem to have. Before these things seem to be reserved, for example, in the case of the Passion, for Holy Week, for Holy Thursday, for Good Friday. Oh, and I was forgetting for the very tiresome gospel of Palm Sunday. With this knowledge of the divine will, the passion of our Lord, for example, reacquires such importance that we feel it very close to us and we want not one of our days to pass without at least a small thought about the passion of our Lord. This reacquires the passion of our Lord, reacquires for us immense value. The sacraments, especially that of the Eucharist, no longer is it simply the obligation of going to Mass on Sundays and communion once a year for Easter to not commit one more sin. In our life, it recovers such an importance that we live doing rounds around the Eucharist, Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Prayer, moments of meditation, of reflection, a more retired life, not only from the distractions of the world, but of its ways and criteria. And we recover the ability to see the worth of the values of the postulates of the true Christian life of detachment from the things of the world and of worldliness and we appreciate more a life 
with less distractions. Why? Because it has awakened in us that taste for all those things that we now find very useful to obtain what we now propose, exposed to the light of living in the divine will. I think all of us here who know, in one way or another, the writings of Luisa, and that in some way have been touched by the grace of God, as if, as if he was calling us to find the light. We can all say that in some way something has changed in the way we approach our life when discovering this great treasure, things that in the past we very much desired or sought after seem to lose their attractiveness and we recover the taste for the things of God and those who did not lose it they increase in the taste for the things of God like someone who has found what they were looking for without knowing what it was that they were looking for moved only by the Holy Spirit and by God to find it to find it at this point in time I think that all of us, more or less, have felt this change by the acceptance of wanting to know the will of God and how God works in His will so that it may work in us and that we may actively work in His will. It is Jesus, God, who tells Luisa, for example, this phrase which is very important because it may summarize it all. My daughter, I come to give you the greatest gift. I say, I come to give you the greatest gift that I can give to you. I add to you and through you. To those who desire it, I come to give you the greatest gift. I come to teach you how to live in my will. At this point, he doesn't tell her, I come to give you my will, because that will of God was given to Adam in creation. When God created Adam, the Bible says in Genesis, and with his breath, Jesus tells Luisa, and with his breath, all of God was infused in Adam. We read that paragraph, and we understand. We understand it in such a human way, like when we breathe into someone, as when doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation or something like that. No. For God to infuse his breath is to infuse all of himself into man. Once man lost the way and the grace of living in the divine will, God did not remove himself. Man was the one that moved away from God. He says to Luisa, I come to give you, to offer you the greatest gift. I come to teach you to live as it is to live in my will. Because that was the greatest gift that God gave to Adam in creation and through Adam to the entire human family. Imagine when Adam, let's say, woke up well, he didn't wake up because he was not asleep. But at the very moment of having been created, and God infuses in him the conscience and the light so that he could operate, what would be the first thing he would have said? Well, what do I do now? I'm here. Now what? 
What do I do? What is it about? What is this? Suddenly the creation rises to his consciousness. And what would he say? What is this about? Imagine a little bit. How did this come about? Since there was no original sin, he actually opens his eyes within God himself and sees not only with the eyes of the body, but with those of the soul, what God was doing, what God does, what God did in created things. And he didn't need to ask, what do I do? But rather, he does together with God what God was doing in all of creation. God, the first model of Adam, God didn't need to give lessons of the divine will because Adam, within the will of God, without original sin, having been created and God having infused co completely in him, Adam knew perfectly well what to do. And to the extent that he was doing together with God what he saw God do in creation, these were lessons of the divine will that God gave to Adam. It is to say, God was teaching Adam in every act that he did. He was teaching Adam how it is to live in the will of God. And that's what Adam lost. Original sin comes and he no longer knew because he no longer had the divine will as life to do life in the will of God and to do what God did in creation. He started doing something else. What a man or a creature separated from God can do in creation. I say separate it from God. That is why when he tells Luisa, I come to give you the greatest gift. I come to teach you how to live in my will. This is precisely to continue with Luisa the lessons of divine will that Adam interrupted in his life and did not want to continue and could not then transmit that knowledge of how one lives in the will of God. And our Lord tells Louisa, I come to make you the greatest gift. I come to teach you how to live in my will. Therefore, those who have read Luisa's writings more extensively can now see all that attitude of how Jesus teaches her, not only with what Luisa writes, but also in how he teaches her to do her acts in the divine will. And Luisa, not exactly in this way, but to help understand in the way of Adam, before sin, who learned, seeing what God was doing, and doing it. So Luisa too, our Lord takes her little by little, because Luisa, like all of us, was born with original sin, and little by little he takes her along the way first of human holiness to bring her to the point of teaching her how to live in the divine will. Luisa describes, outside of myself I saw such and such a thing and I saw how, me, how my love you, how my I love you was left imprinted on every created thing. That is how Jesus was teaching her and Luisa was learning to live in the divine will, to do the will of God as God does as God does it in heaven, so on earth. Likewise, we put our taste in the things of God in the eternal things, and we begin to lose the taste of temporary things.
temporary things that end, we begin to find our happiness. Not only in the writings themselves, but in the measure that the writings became or become life in us. And having found this happiness, we leave behind so many things where we once aimlessly sought that happiness in things, in people, in events. And since neither these things, nor people, nor events have enough dowry to make the creature happy, we would never find it. But since the will of God is the fountain of happiness for God and for those who live in the will of God, we find that this will of God does have the dowry and the sufficient qualities to wrap us in its happiness despite the various circumstances that each of us faces in life, circumstances that many times before made us unhappy, but that now lived or framed with this substance in our souls of the will of God, I repeat, will of God that makes God happy and whoever, whomever lives in it. We find that even in contradictions and setbacks, sufferings and the pains of life, we are going to be happy. Because that happiness, we will discover in the fountain of happiness. That is God. For God, there is no other happiness than to do His will. What can make God happy? To do His will. Because God is eternal. Because God is infinite. Infinitely wise. Because He is God. With all the divine qualities. And an act done by Him is what makes Him happy. We can say it another way. If God did not do any act, if the divine will did not act, God would be a God of photography, still shots. But since His will acts, it is a God movement. If the will of God did not act, it would be like a painting of a sun. Let's place back here a painted sun. Jose Luis is addressing the audience and gesturing to the placement of a painted sun behind him on the stage. To whom of you would it occur to wear a swimsuit and come to this sun to receive the light and the warmth of this painted sun? Absolutely no one. But if that painted sun entered into the action of being sun, and in that very instant, it would give all of its effects, then this photograph of a sun would turn into true sun. Such is God. God is not a picture, an image, but rather He is a God that putting Himself in act, He is a God in act. That is why what forms the happiness of God is His will in act because it is what forms. We have to speak in this manner, but in God everything is eternal. So it is not that He is forming, but I say it in this way so we understand each other. Every time the will of God does an act, 
it forms a divine happiness for God and for those who live in Him. For those who do not live in Him, in this divine will, it seems that the divine will becomes a fountain of unhappiness. How many times those dispositions of the will of God apparently make the creature unhappy. I no longer speak of the dispositions of the commandments and all that, but more specific dispositions, like to allow an illness, to allow a death, the will of God. Am I not saying that for God, the operating of His will forms His happiness? And we unhappy? All because we do not live in the divine will. But, as our Lord tells Louisa, I come to give you the greatest gift. I come to teach you how to live in my will. As if saying to her, I have taught you. And in the first volumes, our Lord could say to her, I have shown you all the dispositions of my will. I have already taught you all the commandments and the order and way you should be with him so we can be friends, so that you are in order with me. Now I want to take you deeper. I don't want you just like this, now respecting and continuing in that order that you should be. I ex accept you in my will, and I want to go to yours. If Louisa comes out of fulfilling the dispositions of the will of God, the will of God cannot become life in her. Just like us, we have to form our life in the will of God, but in full and in perfect harmony with the dispositions of the will of God. And to know these dispositions of the will of God we have, as I have explained, the Ten Commandments. The Gospel, but not in the manner of the Protestants. Rather, the Gospel, the way the Church teaches it, that is the magisterium of the Church. Here we have all these dispositions and to enter, to the live in the divine will, the first thing that is needed is to be in order with these dispositions. No one that lives in sin, for whatever reason, can believe to live in the divine will. No one who is not in perfect harmony and attuned with the magisterium of the church in his life can believe to be living in the divine will and do acts out of harmony with the church and aim to do them in the will of God. That's absurd. Therefore, it is necessary to go deeper in the knowledge of the order that God wants that he wants us to have with him. As I was saying a few minutes ago, when attracted by the writings of Louisa, we discover that the will of God wants to make life in us, and we life in it. And we feel an attraction to all the dispositions of the will of God, even to those dispositions which we once defended ourselves and stood against, we find now pleasing. We will find anew the value to take full advantage of them. So many dispositions, so often before, had been a heavy weight for us. Here, in the audience, there are adults aware of, for example, all aspects of matrimonial life. The whole aspect of chastity and youth, obedience to parents, 
respect for the elderly? How many times before we found it to be a struggle for us? Finding this light, this new way, this great treasure we want to access, that we want to reach. Everything changes. What before was an obstacle to battle now becomes a friend. I will give a few examples. Thou shalt not fornicate is no longer an enemy. Now, thou shalt not fornicate is a friend. Thou shalt love God with all your heart is no longer an enemy. It is now a friend. And so with everything else. Then the, the life in the divine will is being formed in the soul somehow bit by bit. In the measure that the soul, on one hand, begins to find, the, find those known dispositions of the will of God and begins to set herself in order with them. On the other hand, as she discovers the will of God within her and wants to make it life and wants to model, wants to model her life according to the will of God and how it operates. The example I will give is one that some may have already heard. Here, Jose Luis is rummaging through his notes. Each and every one of us here today has his or her own will. I have mine. Any one of you could tell me. Listen, Jose Luis, I want to do your will. Okay, that is fine. I would say, and you would ask, what do I need to do first? And I would need to tell you, if I want you to stand up, I need to inform you of it. If I want you to run, to bring me water, or do anything else, I need to give you my dispositions. So you would do it as I would do it. And many times it may be difficult for you because you may want to do something else. And you may tell me, I, want, I don't want to bring you water now because I need to eat, I'm very hungry, I would tell you, no, no, now you're going to do as I ask, bring me a glass of water. So if you really want to do my will, you would have to die to your will and do mine. If you get to fulfill all of my dispositions, I may think, you are perfectly doing my will. And the results would be fulfilling my dispositions, but in reality wouldn't be able to enter inside myself to participate of the qualities of my will. You would stay outside of myself, although you are complying with the dispositions of my will. And if I had some qualities in my will that you don't have, you won't be able to have them. So let's analyze it. Did you obey me? Yes, heroically. Yes, but still you would be very far from possessing my qualities. So I could again ask you, are you doing my will? And you would say, yes. And I could say, look at what you, 
look, I want you to go further. My will is richer, greater, more powerful, stronger. I not only want you to obey me, I want you to enter inside myself. Or I want you to take my will as yours so you can do your acts in my will so that your acts won't have any more the limitations of your will. Rather, by entering in mine, because I allow it, your acts can now take the qualities of my will so they are done in my will as if I would have done them. Let us both live just one will, my will. So now, what will be the purpose of having a will? To do my will. Then all acts that you do, I will feel them as done by me and with my qualities. You will be dead to yourself in the sense that you will be dead to act on your own. You will be alive, very alive, to operate in my will, that I may recognize your acts as done by me. Well then, this is living in the divine will, and although it can not be done between us or among yourselves in reality, I can't tell you come to operate inside myself. Even if we have the same intentions, I will never be able to feel that you are operating in my will. But with God, it is different. With Him, we can because that has always been His plan when He created us. And now we have been shown how this is possible in the humanity of Jesus. How His divinity operated in His humanity. Jesus, second person of the Blessed Trinity, incarnate, in the humanity of Jesus, the incarnate Word, He had two wills, the human will and the divine will, without being confused, without being suppressed, operating together, such that everything the humanity of Jesus did in the divine will was done in the divine will with the qualities of divine operation. The same with you. If you come to live in my will, all your acts with your will done in mine take on the qualities of mine. And I say, here we are operating in my will. That is how it was in Jesus. And not only in this way, because later on, Jesus asked for it on our behalf. Father, that each and every one be one, like you and I are one. As the Father and the incarnate Word were one because one was the life that lived in them, each one with its different person. That is what Jesus asked on our behalf, that each and every one be one like you and me. Let's meditate how this came about. Of course, it did not come about because it is as the Father and the Incarnate Word are one. And that's what we are called to, that's what we are called to, because that was the original plan of creation. It is as if Jesus would have said that prayer before the creation of man, and he would have said to the Father, Father, I ask you, that Adam be one as you and I are one. And they would have created in him in that moment. And then Adam would have left that will as we all know. And later Jesus asked again on our behalf for each one of us this, 
that Jesus, God wants for us to enter into his will, to live in it, is the original plan of creation. And how blessed, how blessed we are now that we have access to this thanks to Luisa's writings and especially to the work that God did in Luisa which led her to this. Father, may Luisa be one with us as you and I are one in the fullness that the Father and the Incarnate Word operated. I haven't mentioned the Blessed Virgin but when we speak of Jesus, we are automatically speaking of the Blessed Virgin for those who know how to find her in Jesus. More or less, this would be a sketch of what it is to live in the divine will. This talk serves as an introduction and program for all the meditations we will have in the next few days to masticate or understand in one way or another living in the divine will to understand it better each time being better disposed so we can do our part and Jesus God can do his part in us and we truly become one with the Father, that is to say, with the Holy Trinity, as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in the Incarnate Word. This will be more or less our theme for the next few days. I want to open a possibility, not because you are closed, but to provide an opportunity for a space for you to ask questions you may consider important by writing them down. Providing us important topics to make out of this conference. Not a course nor a series of lectures. Nor a list of synoptic tables but a meditation of reflection to aid us all to aid us all to live more intensely and with more clarity the will of God which is what we have proposed for ourselves whoever wants can ask questions and we will be answering them in the days to come I hope everyone here will be attending every day I promise you that I will be here I think it's good to reflect <laughs> about everything we've heard. I am not saying to take a break and dissipate. I understand we all need to take a little, but try to remain as much as possible reflecting on these topics so that they don't just disappear from us as soon as the talk is over. These are not light topics, and one can easily become distracted. Try to keep within a normality a prayerful ambience around these topics. Let's take a break for a few minutes. If there's time, we will take another break and continue. <laughs> 